Chapter 41, Matthew's Living Room Eh? Did that big sister with the good figure just go out through the window? Facing Sift's confusion, Matthew explained with a smile. She's a druid. Is that so, Sif placed her hands behind her back and looked a little shy. Matthew, I came here today mainly to thank you for saving my life. Matthew was stunned. Haven't you already thanked me? He was already thinking about how to reject Sif's next visit. However, in the next second, Sif quickly took out a small bag from behind her and handed it to Matthew. Last time, it was a verbal thank you. This time, I brought a gift. Sif's eyes are shining. You won't reject me, will you? Matthew stared at the luggage in his hand, unable to refuse. Magic bag, super version 12 slots in the shortcut bar, 5 cubic meters of basic storage space, zero weight and increased movement speed. Additional spell, biscuit spell, can automatically generate 10 biscuits per day as food. How much is this thing? Matthew asked in a hoarse voice. 1400 gold coins. It cost me all my pocket money that I'd saved before I was 15. Sif said frankly. But it doesn't matter. I'll be 16 soon. My father will give me a lot of pocket money again. I can't take it. It's too expensive. Matthew said with a conflicted expression. My life is worth more than 1,400 gold coins. Sif smiled and said, and I've already bought it. You know the situation in Rolling Stone Town. There aren't many mages and no one else can use it. Matthew looked troubled. A phantom rushed into the kitchen and snatched the luggage. I'll accept it on his behalf. Peggy said loudly. Matthew glared at her. Did you tell her that I really want a better backpack? Peggy spread her hands. I said that you only wanted an enhanced version, the one that costs 500 gold coins. Who knew that she would buy the super version? Sif spread her hands. Anyway, the gift has already been given out. You can't return it back for me. As she spoke, she slumped lazily on the sofa. Matthew sighed and said, Okay, okay. I appreciate your kindness. I really need this. Thank you, Sif. Sif blinked. Everyone wants you back in class I am interested in history, but the books are so boring. Matthew shook his head helplessly. I really don't have time for classes recently, but if you want, I can teach you in private. Sure. Sif straightened up from the sofa. Let's start from the Hundred City. Division. Last time, you didn't teach me how the Seven Saint Alliance ruled the Hundred City States. Matthew nodded. He returned to his room and took out a thick history book. Then, he sat in front of Sif and began to explain. Rigor, who was trying to hide in the haystack, was shocked when he heard the conversation in the living room. Is it just a lecture? At this moment, a carefree skeleton walked out of the kitchen door. Rigor curled his body. The skeleton circled around the windowsill and walked back. Fortunately, it didn't discover me. Rigor was rejoicing. Suddenly, he heard a conversation coming from the room. Matthew, Matthew. I've found a legal, stable, and profitable way to make money. Do tell. We can use your charm and seduce a few underage girls to come to our house for classes. Then we can sell the sitting area around the windowsill for a high price. Hey! How do you know it won't work if you don't give it a try? Since we have a potential customer, you should go and ask. Rigor silently raised his head. Then, he met Matthew's complicated gaze. Uh, Mr. Rigor, would you buy a ticket? Matthew asked politely. Chapter 42, Tower Spirit The next morning. At 3.50, Matthew opened his eyes on time. After washing up, he went to the kitchen to grab a loaf of bread and left the house amidst the chirping of birds in the morning. He did not leave the mage area as usual. Instead, he walked toward the center of the mage area, where no one else had ever visited. The morning of early spring was still cold. Matthew walked past a well-maintained bush. Drops of dew swirled along the leaves, and a few drops even spilled on his shoes. A few minutes later. He wolfed down the bread and stood in front of a two-story house in the middle of the mage area. Dong dong dong. The bell suddenly rang from the bungalow. This meant that it was four o'clock sharp. Matthew quickly stepped forward. He gently knocked on the door with his right hand until an exaggerated face appeared on the door. He then said the password, a day's plan is in the morning. The strange face split open quickly, revealing a dark, dome-shaped entrance. Good morning, Matthew. 
Welcome to Crucible House. I'll wait for you on the top floor. Remember to press the acceleration button on the elevator a few more times. You'll experience an extraordinary pleasure. A mechanical voice came from inside. Matthew lowered his head and walked in. What appeared in front of him was an extremely vast space. The floor was paved with a strange material like mercury, the dome of the sky was lined with stars, six marble pillars rose into the sky, and the two sides were lined with sculpture-like automatons. This was the Crucible House. It was part of a mage tower that the great mage Ronan had made public. Here, you could buy magic tools and materials, borrow magic books, rent magic laboratories, forge magic equipment, find an adventuring team, and so on. It was similar to the Adventurer's Guild in many online games, except that the Crucible House only served mages. Moreover, the entry time was very strict. It was only 15 minutes between 4 in the morning and 4.15 in the morning. If they missed it, they would have to come back the next day. There were at least four entrances to the Crucible House south of Eversong Forest. However, Matthew never bumped into anyone every time he came here. He speculated that it might be because there were too few mages in this world at the moment and that the Crucible House charged an entrance fee. Thirty gold coins each time wasn't too expensive, but it was still an expense. Take Matthew as an example. If he did not have the need to borrow books from this place, he would never have come to the Crucible House. The food and service here were good but expensive. The materials and tools provided by Master Ronan were much better than those outside. But if Matthew had a choice, he would rather travel a few hundred kilometers to Bion City to find a familiar merchant to buy the same materials and tools. Unfortunately, he had no choice. This was the kind of place where one would unconsciously bend over when they entered the door if they were not rich. Matthew walked to the nearest marble pillar. This was actually a magic elevator hidden in the pillar. You could go to the floor you wanted according to your needs. Different floors had different constructs to serve you. Of course, you could also choose to have human servers receive you, but it would cost more. When Matthew approached, he was surprised to find a woman wearing black-rimmed glasses and a traditional robe waiting anxiously before the elevator. Ding! The pillar rotated to both sides, and the magic elevator appeared in front of them. Ah, why don't you go first? The female mage said to Matthew somewhat unnaturally. She seemed to be particularly constrained. Matthew sized her up and shook his head. No, you go first. I'll wait for the next one. The female mage was a little surprised. However, after seeing Matthew's determined expression, she was shocked. She quickly nodded and thanked him in a low voice. Then, she jogged into the lift. By the way, if a voice asks you to press the acceleration button later, remember to reject it. The elevator doors were about to close. Matthew smiled and gave his advice. Through the crack, the female mage tilted her head in confusion. The elevator went up in an instant. Matthew waited patiently for a few minutes. A brand new elevator booth unfolded in front of him. He walked in calmly. As a close friend of Ronan, the privilege he enjoyed in the Crucible House was Tower Spirit 177's service. This would greatly facilitate him to find what he wanted in the vast sea of emolage. There was no need to pay labor fees. Matthew was very grateful for this. The elevator doors slowly closed. He could feel himself rising at a slow and comfortable speed. After a few seconds, a stiff voice rang in his ears. Sir, according to the current speed, you will need 29 hours and 7 minutes to reach the floor you want. So, do you need an accelerated service? I am your friendly companion, Tower Spirit No. 247. Matthew immediately refused. No. Don't play this kind of trick anymore. 177, you sound like a broken record. A few seconds later. The voice continued, 177 has been killed and replaced by me, 369. Now I control the Crucible House. If you don't want to fall, you better press the acceleration button. It will make you very happy. Matthew smiled and said, it can indeed make people very happy, but I'm sorry, I've already vomited once. After that time, I swear I won't fall for your trick again. The voice laughed coldly. Chapter 43, Tower Spirit Feeling stubborn today, aren't we? Not bad, Matthew. You've grown up. You don't really think I need you to press the button to speed up the elevator, do you? I'm the greatest tower spirit in history. Who am I? King of the Crucible House. If you continue to be so impertinent, I'll personally help you speed up. 
I'm ready. Matthew pulled the elevator handrail. The voice of the tower genie instantly became evil and ghostly. Are you really ready? He he he, Matthew, I'm going to speed up now. Matthew closed his eyes and tightened his grip on the armrest. Don't be afraid. I'll be very gentle, Matthew. The tower spirit was still threatening. Matthew suddenly opened his eyes. Are you finally afraid, Matthew? The tower spirit was proud. Matthew let go and looked at the elevator panel. We've arrived at the top floor. One any UO or open you. Matthew stepped out. The top floor of the crucible house was a large open space. Above his head was the boundless starry sky. In the open space, a golem that was more than three meters tall, made entirely of clay, and wearing an exaggerated suit walked toward Matthew. It didn't look angry because of the failure of the prank. Instead, it greeted Matthew with a humble tone. Good morning, Matthew. Welcome to the Crucible House. Your humble servant, Tower Spirit 177, is at your service. However, Matthew did not dare to put on airs in front of him. One had to know that the construct in front of him had a bad personality, craved a mate, and was extremely lonely. It was also at level 23. It was said that it was the only legendary golem in the known city-state territory of the human kingdom. Matthew's strongest bone dragon was no match for its punch. Dear Mr. 177. Matthew went straight to the point. I want to find and borrow books from two different categories. Keywords. 177, who had entered his work mode, said concisely. The first keyword is Shinnik power. I'm looking for books and information related to charging Shinnik items. Matthew quickly said. The second keyword is the So country. Secondary keywords may include Emperor, Great Wall and Jade Phoenix. 177 pondered for three seconds after listening. Then he replied. Pure Shinnik research books are very rare, but there are still some books related to charging Shinnik items. I'm not talented, but I happen to have some knowledge in the field of Shinnik abilities. If you can be more specific, I might be able to answer your question directly. That way, you can save a book loan fee. Matthew looked at it suspiciously. Will there be an additional consultation? He couldn't help but be careful. In the Crucible House, borrowing books was much cheaper than consulting. You worry too much, Matthew. 177 calmly said. There was originally a consultation fee, but it has been offset by the problem brought by the second keyword. Regrettably, the information related to the Sioux Nation is classified as a level 11 secret. In the entire Seven Saint Alliance, only the four guardians and the other three heavenly mages are qualified to view them. If you really want to know more about this, the suggestion here is to kill Ronan, that old man, and replace him as the guardian of the south. That way, you can do whatever you want. Matthew didn't find this particularly strange. There must be a reason why the So country was rarely known on this continent. The Seven Saint Alliance definitely had their own considerations when it came to blocking this news. With his current strength, there was indeed no need to rush to gather information in this area. He sighed. So you cancelled my consultation fee out of pity. 177 said seriously. No, I'm angry. Who am I? The greatest tower spirit in history. King of the Crucible House. I worked hard for Ronan without sleep and rest. In the end, when I went to look up information related to So Country just now, I was actually denied access. How dare the old men of the Alliance refuse the Crucible House well, those secondary keywords you mentioned earlier were pretty good, it's mine now refuse the request of the Crucible House's Emperor. Of course, I want to take revenge on him. Not only will the consultation fee be waived, but you'll follow me down later and take whatever you like. Don't worry. I'll support you in everything. I hope that Ronan will die in the Astral World, and I, Tower Spirit 177, will become the guardian of the South and enjoy the beauties of the world. Matthew fell silent after hearing 177's bold words. How did Ronan train the Tower Spirits? Why are you praying for his downfall? He muttered in his heart, then hurriedly changed the topic and explained the origin of the cough staff. 177 said decisively. That's simple. The grade of such chinic items is not high, and the charging method is easy. The first method is to find an existence with Shinnik power to act as your energy source. Then, you'll go on a stroll around the abyss. Some demons have Shinnik energy, but they may not know how to use Shinnik power. However, their power is enough for you to charge common Shinnik items. 
Here, I recommend the succubus. At least one third of the succubus have a source of shinic energy in their bodies, but they almost never use it. They only know how to be in heat all day long. Considering that their physique is sturdy and durable, you can use them for many different things. At the same time, they are also a cost-effective choice. Do you want me to show you some examples? The rock golem grinned wickedly at Matthew. Matthew rubbed his temples. What about the second method? Hold your staff and imagine that you are coughing, said 177. Matthew was stunned. Is it that simple? 177 nodded, of course, it's simple. This method is very inefficient. You need to be mentally prepared. Matthew silently noted down the two methods and bowed to the Tower Spirit to thank it before bidding farewell. Chapter 44, Tower Spirit Are you leaving already? 1771's tone became more lively. You know, Matthew, I'm very lonely. Matthew felt a chill run down his spine. Aren't there a lot of constructs in the Crucible house? Could it be that none of them caught your eye, he asked politely. Don't even mention those mediocre female subjects. Ronan couldn't even fathom the creation of high-level wisdom, and the constructs he created were all trash. I really wonder how he created me back then. Maybe he lied. I'm not his biological son at all. 177 said unhappily, I've expressed my needs to him many times, but what about him? There was once when I told him that my mate at least had to match my size. Do you know what he did? He caught a dinosaur for me. Matthew said in surprise, Dinosaur? Do you mean it as a descriptive term? 177 took a look, shook his head and said. No, literally. He caught AF asterisking female Tyrannosaurus Rex. God knows how many wicked things he did when he participated in the revival of ancient mythical creatures project. Matthew fell silent. But that T-Rex was quite strong. The tower spirit added. What happened after that? Matthew could only force himself to continue this conversation. After that? It wasn't easy for me and Little Flower. Little Flower was the name I gave her. She wasn't very intelligent and had a bad temper, which complimented me perfectly. We had a certain degree of affection for each other, and our lives were quite fun. However, that damned Ronan turned around and took Little Flower away. He even said that there was a problem with the project and that the others in the Seven Saint Alliance had stopped it. Therefore, he had to return the test subject. 177 said bitterly. In order to make it up to me, he caught another cyclops for me. That monster's level is almost as high as mine. The good news is that I was also interested in this new lover. Matthew nodded. I guess there must be bad news. 177 sighed and said, when I couldn't find the entrance for three days and three nights, I realized that Ronan was so careless that he got the gender of the cyclops wrong. Matthew was stunned. The sun was high in the sky when he left the crucible house. Matthew came to the oak forest tiredly. In the cottage, after taking a short rest, he began his work. However, when he walked to the north of the oak forest with a shovel, he suddenly realized that something was wrong. A trace on the ground had been erased. If it wasn't for the oak tree domain's support, Matthew might not even have noticed this trace. Soldier. He silently woke up the blade dancer, who had been waiting in the cabin. He wanted to use his domain to communicate with the oak forest. At this moment, a few oak tree fairies flew out. They began to pour out their grievances. An ugly, fierce, and big guy came to the forest last night. And he helped you block the attack of an evil witherer. That was how you survived the invasion of the witherer. That big guy didn't go far. So he merely went into hiding. Matthew's expression changed. In the end, it became slightly gloomy. He had a rough idea of who the fairies were talking about. However, he was more concerned about the Witherer. This was the Druid's nemesis. They obtained power by destroying the forest. Once a forest was targeted by the Witherers, it would be reduced to scorched earth. I know. Don't worry. I won't go anywhere until I deal with that Witherer. Matthew said as he gripped the shovel in his hand. A moment later. He continued walking toward his plot of land. No matter what happened, planting trees was still the most important thing. At night. The moonlight shone brightly. When the first ray of moonlight shone on the world. The badge on Matthew's chest reacted. Due to your performance in killing three violent Zerg guards, you have become an official member of the Moonlight Society. You have obtained a spell, 
Moonfire. Chapter 45, Birth of Evil. Moonfire, guide a ray of moonlight to attack the target. When it hits, it will deal fixed damage. After 15 seconds, it will continue to cause moonlight scorch damage. When you cast Moonfire under the moonlight, the damage dealt will be doubled. Moonfire could not cause any damage to golems. This spell deals an additional 100% damage to undead creatures. Matthew made a straw doll and tested the damage of Moonfire indoors and outdoors. It could only be said that it was a little sad. The double damage from the moonlight is only equivalent to a level 5-6 spell. Without the moonlight, it barely scratches the enemy. Although the badge had the ability to release moonlight and could deal damage in most situations, it was still too weak. Matthew was not very satisfied with this spell. One of the few advantages of Moonfire was its low mana consumption. The burning effect had a certain tactical significance, and, it looked pretty. Suppressing undead creatures is also an advantage. Matthew comforted himself. In fact, he did not expect much from the spells bestowed by the goddess of moonlight. She was a god, not a mage. Her spell level might not even be as good as some fourth or fifth tier mages. The advantage of the gods was that they could use their divinity to imbue their spells. However, after the ascension of the heavenly palace, they were no longer able to cast divine spells on the human world. Matthew believed that this moonfire spell should have been a divine spell created by the goddess of the moonlight. Later, the goddess had to modify it so her believers could use it. Thinking about it this way. The goddess was in quite a quandary. No wonder she was so humble. However, the goddess of moonlight's low profile may have existed since the Age of Enlightenment. Her domain is the moonlight. This means that the domain of the moon has already been taken by some other divine. Her power will be limited. Matthew rubbed his believer badge and thought casually. But Ella once mentioned that the moonlight woodlands had a period of glory. Could it be that she was once the goddess of the moon and not just the goddess of moonlight? However, it didn't matter. Matthew quickly walked back to the hut and politely praised, praise the moonlight. In the following days, Matthew's focus in life returned to reality, especially planting trees. He used the extra time to search for potential witherers. Unfortunately, his divination skills were really weak. When he divined the location of the witherers, he somehow saw a woman coming out of the bath. Judging from the architectural style behind her, it was obviously a craftsman's district or a commercial district in Rolling Stone Town. However, that woman was clearly not with the witherers. Afraid of being perceived as a peeping Tom, Matthew hurriedly covered the crystal ball with sackcloth. For this period of time, he decided to stop divination. The witherer had not been found yet, but it was getting easier for Matthew to track down the whereabouts of Eli. He found a time to activate the oak tree domain. As Eli had resonated with his domain, Matthew could immediately lock onto his position as long as he was in the oak forest. From the content of Matthew's perception, Eli's daily routine was very monotonous. It looked like he seemed to be patrolling the forest very seriously. Matthew observed for a while and let him be. His forest was full of hidden talents. There were skeletons, necromancers, and corpses. What was wrong with having a proper druid? In the moonlight woodlands, Ella had repeatedly urged Matthew to continue clearing the MVE, but Matthew had always used the excuse of insufficient human power to brush her off. In fact, this reason was not completely unreasonable. He had lost so many skeleton soldiers. It would take some time for Matthew to resummon all the soldiers. Samantha never showed up again after that day. Matthew guessed that she had gone to sort out the information he wanted about the So country. The mission at the Hive was really not urgent. The Goddess of Moonlight's mission was for him to eliminate one violent Zerg guard, and Matthew had done more than that. As for the side quest of eliminating all the Zergs, Matthew had given up the idea of pushing through the quest after learning that the Hive was related to the Antu Empire. It was better to do things steadily. During this period, two things happened. Matthew found some time to buy ten air element restraining runes and a small bottle of the ghoul's nail powder from a merchant in Bune City. These two items were prepared for the next summoning of zombies. The other thing was the transfer of Riagar's private territory to Matthew. Matthew received a free land gift document signed by the Lord from an unfamiliar city hall official. Of course. This matter absolutely could not be completed openly. Therefore, under the hint of the official, Matthew went to see Ms. Liz again, who complained that Matthew should have come to pick up the land lease document earlier. On the surface, Matthew had become the tenant of the territory. However, 
only a few people knew that he was actually also the landowner. Liz was very straightforward, and she even gave Matthew the promised allowance in full. When Matthew walked out of the city hall, Matthew, who had his pockets tinkling, felt that life was wonderful. He had only saved Sif once due to convenience, but the father and daughter had thanked him with generous gifts. He felt a little guilty. There was a moment when Matthew even had a wicked thought in his heart. If only this would happen again. Very quickly. He seriously banished his evil idea. Chapter 46, Birth of Evil I shouldn't wish for Sif to get into any more harm. The child has already suffered. Although. I wouldn't mind saving Riagar one time. Just like that. Five days later. In the evening. In the oak forest. Matthew carried the sack and shovel and walked leisurely back to the hut. When he was less than 50 meters away from the wooden house. His domain suddenly triggered automatically. The big guy is coming. An oak tree secretly told him. Matthew turned to the west. A figure rushed over. He rushed in front of Matthew, paused for a moment, and then asked in a particularly unhappy tone, it's fine if there are no animals in your forest, but why aren't there any berries? Eli glared at him. Matthew thought for a moment. Maybe because this is an oak forest. Eli's dissatisfaction became even more serious. That's not what I meant. Of course, I know that this is an oak forest, but why are there only oak trees in the forest and no other plants? Matthew put down his shovel and explained in a friendly manner, It's like this, Mr. Eli. I just started to plant this forest. I'm not a forestry expert. I only know how to plant oak trees for now. Eli revealed an incredulous expression. Then, he sneered. It's indeed in line with my understanding of necromancers. How can there be only one kind of tree in a forest? Forget it. I don't want to talk about this with you today. You know, shapeshifters like me often need a lot of meat to replenish their energy. Of course, I have mastered many druid spells that enable my survival. For example, I have a spell that can help me fill my stomach with a small amount of berries. However, the problem is that you have nothing here. Matthew looked enlightened. He was wondering why Eli had been running around in the forest for the past few days. So he was looking for food. So, you hadn't eaten for five days? Matthew hurriedly asked. Four days. Eli revealed a cold expression that showed disdain for talking to Matthew. On the third day, I couldn't help but steal a chicken from the farm next door. But I can't do too much of this kind of thing, and this debt will be on you. Matthew, I'm guarding the forest for you. Guard the forest for Matthew? Matthew thought for a moment and connected the cause and effect. It seems like he wants to repay me for me bringing him into the oak domain. Matthew's opinion of Eli changed a lot. In that case, Mr. Eli, let's have a meal at my place. He sent out an invitation. I won't eat with a necromancer. I'll stay here. You can bring the food to me. Eli's attitude was still stinking and unyielding. Matthew didn't mind. In that case, I can only give you this first. The magic bag that Sif had given him just happened to produce a large batch of biscuits. Matthew handed it over. Eli took the DISC-111T Anna smelled it, Fnan Nuklet eagerly. Matthew smiled. He turned around and went back to his room to eat. After dinner. He found that Eli was still in the same spot. Hence, he took the initiative to go over and say hello, what's wrong, Mr. Eli? Are you not full? Eli glanced at him. I'm full. Thank you. His tone was still very firm. After saying that, he glanced at Matthew's wooden house. What did you eat just now? Matthew pursed his oily lips. Just a simple meal. Is that so? I smell sausages. Eli looked at him suspiciously. Matthew changed the topic. So, the reason why you are staying in my forest is to repay me for the little help I inadvertently gave you? If that's the case, there's no need for that because it was just an accident. I only wanted to provide Samantha with domain enlightenment. You were able to comprehend it purely because of your amazing talent. When he heard Matthew mention Samantha, the veins on Eli's forehead twitched. He used a lot of strength to hold back his anger. I have a ruler in my heart. I won't leave until I pay back what I owe you. Don't underestimate me. We, druids, are the true kings of the jungle. If I didn't guard the forest for you, these oak trees would have been destroyed by the evil. Witherers. Matthew laughed. He wanted to tell Eli that he didn't owe him anything. 
However, Matthew swallowed his words when he saw the proud face of Eli. Hence, he nodded and said, If you want to stay, of course, you can. Please do as you please. I'll get someone to prepare a portion of food for you. As he spoke, he took out a pen and paper, seemingly preparing to record. The corner of Eli's mouth twitched. No need. The biscuits just now will do. Matthew chuckled. Biscuit or sausage? Eli hesitated for a moment. Sausage then. Do you want anything else? For example, drinks. Matthew asked again. Eli shook his head decisively. No need. Milk or coffee? Matthew did not seem to hear him. Um, milk, Eli answered awkwardly. Then, from tomorrow morning onwards, you can come here to find me before I start planting trees. I will give you the food for that day. Matthew lowered his head and scribbled a few lines. He looked at his serious expression. A thought suddenly came to Eli's mind. Does he treat his employees so well all the time? No, damn it. I'm not an employee of this necromancer. He raised his head fiercely. However, he was shocked to find that Matthew had already left. Chapter 47, Birth of Evil Night fell, and everything was silent. Matthew, who had finished his meditation for the day, pushed open the door and walked out. The moonlight was bright outside. Eli was sitting under an oak tree not far away, staring blankly at the moon. Matthew did not greet him. He walked straight to the northwest. However, very quickly. Footsteps came from behind him. What are you going to do in the middle of the night? Necromancer. Eli asked from behind. It's a private matter. Matthew replied concisely, you'd better not follow me. As soon as he said that. Eli seemed even more interested. He quickly caught up with Matthew. What bad things are you hiding from? Matthew glanced at him. It's not that I need to hide anything from you. I just feel that summoning a zombie in front of a druid would be a little blasphemous. You've already done more blasphemous things to Samantha. Then, he realized what Matthew was about to do. How dare you summon zombies in the oak forest? The anger in the corner of Eli's eyes was about to fill up again. This is the domain of nature, a sacred land that cannot be defiled. Matthew replied slowly, if this counts as defiling, then nature has almost been ruined by me. Eli's temples were throbbing. He suppressed his anger and looked at Matthew. Then aren't you afraid that I'll destroy your evil ritual? Matthew looked at him meaningfully. This is my domain. You'd better not do anything stupid, Eli. As he spoke, he walked to the skeleton dorm. He pulled open the cover. He began to transport the corpses outside. Eli watched this scene with a gloomy expression. He knew that even though Matthew looked like he was only at tier 2, with the support of the oak tree territory, he did not have much chance of winning. If he wanted to launch a sneak attack, Matthew could activate his domain immediately. The repulsive force of the domain would provide him with enough room to maneuver. After the domain was activated, not only would Matthew be buffed, but as a druid, Eli would also be weakened by the changes in the environment. This was the power of a domain. Not to mention, this necromancer in front of him obviously had many hidden cards. These days in the forest. It wasn't the first time that Eli had felt killing intent from Matthew. It was a pressure that only a rogue of at least tier 3 could give it to him. I won't interfere with your ritual, but I want to witness the birth of evil with my own eyes. After I repay you, I will destroy all the evil creatures you summoned. Said Eli grimly. Matthew ignored him. He placed the bodies of the five arsonists in a row in the open space under the moonlight. He didn't explain himself. However, necromancers generally believed that summoning zombies under sufficient moonlight would be easier, and there was also a chance of producing high-quality zombies. Matthew would rather believe it than not. He quickly sprinkled a handful of corpse powder and a small amount of ghoul's nail powder evenly on each corpse. He then equipped them with the air element concealing rune that he had purchased previously. After doing all this, Matthew began a long chant. Undead summoning took a long time to cast, but even for the slowest necromancer, it would only take about five minutes at most. However, Matthew took twelve minutes to cast it. The reason was simple. At first, he was just fooling around. Although he was willing to believe in Eli's character, he had to be extra careful at this critical moment. It was not until Eli squatted down impatiently that Matthew began to summon the undead. In the forest. The necromancer's chanting was rhythmic. Dark clouds floated by. 
Eli's face flickered. Suddenly. One of the corpses stood up stiffly. Immediately after. Corpses crawled up from the ground one after another. Eli subconsciously jumped up from the ground. But in the next second. He was surprised to sense that the oak forest around him seemed to have come alive. The night wind blew. Wisps of green light appeared on the oak trees. In the end, it merged into the bodies of the five zombies. This scene also shocked Matthew. He couldn't help but look at the record panel. Hint, you have successfully completed the summoning of the undead, first time slash zombie. You received five undead creatures, zombies slash average level seven. Your zombies were blessed by the oak tree domain when they were born. They received the bark spell. Bark spell, passive your zombie skin will automatically form a layer of tough ancient tree skin, armor plus three, and the tree skin will provide a certain amount of damage reduction when they receive damage. Zombies that knew the bark spell? Matthew was stunned. He wanted to take a closer look at the data of his zombie followers. At this moment, another change occurred. A strong ray of moonlight shone down. The five zombies were bathed in the moonlight. Their bodies seemed to have started a wonderful transformation. Chapter 48, Silver Moon Zombie This unique moonlight lasted for 15 seconds. After the light dissipated, both Eli and Matthew were shocked. A layer of silver-gray light flowed on the bodies of the five zombies. The glow appeared once every six seconds. Although it was fleeting, it gave people a sacred feeling. Zombies blessed by the moonlight? I must be crazy. Eli rubbed his eyes desperately. However, nothing changed. On the other side, Matthew also received the latest notification. Your zombies were blessed by the goddess of moonlight at the beginning of their birth. They received level increase, holy moon armor and moonlight power. Your zombies have evolved into silver moon zombies. You're undead. Summoning, zombies, has new abilities. Level increase. Your zombies average level increased by one level, current level. Holy Moon Armor, under the moonlight, your zombie will receive a layer of Holy Moonlight Armor, Armor plus one, and possess a minor transcendent, Holy Temperament, Charm plus one slash one Intimidation plus ten. Before the Holy Moon Armor is broken, your zombies will not receive additional damage from spells or items that restrain undead creatures. Moonlight Power, under the moonlight, your zombies have strength plus one. Movement speed plus 50%. Silver Moon Zombie? Did the Goddess of Moonlight take over the naming rights? Matthew grumbled in his heart. The Silver Moon Zombies were obviously stronger than normal zombies. However, what he was more concerned about was the Goddess of Moonlight's constant buffs. A goddess who was once high and mighty had repeatedly shown goodwill to a mortal. Either the goddess had discerned that Matthew's future achievements were limitless and had come to curry favor with him in advance, or she was in a precarious situation. Matthew guessed it was the latter. First, she struck Ella with lightning. Then, she gave me a badge and a bless sins. Now, even MV zombie under lenses have gotten a share of the benefits. This is definitely not something that can be gained by killing a few wild zerg. Guards. However, Matthew was not worried about the goddess making any unreasonable requests. After all, the initiative was in his hands now. Yes. A silver moon zombie suddenly raised its head. It was facing the moon, and wisps of white gas were spewing out from its half-rotten lips and teeth. Coupled with its yellow teeth and the sores on its neck, it looked especially evil and strange. Matthew walked over to take a closer look, his eyes constantly revealing a satisfied expression. Zombies and skeletons might be undead creatures of the same level in the eyes of ordinary people. However, in the eyes of the necromancer, the difference between the two could not be clearer. Zombies were much stronger than skeletons. One should not underestimate the dozens of pounds of rotten meat that zombies had more than skeletons. It was this rotten meat that gave zombies stronger characteristics. First was the level. Skeleton soldiers were mostly between levels 3 and 4. Meanwhile, the zombies were at least level 5, and Matthew's Silver Moon zombies were at level 8. The second was zombies' defensive ability. It was common in knowledge that skeleton soldiers had basically zero defense. When they were attacked, they had no shield. Therefore, except for a few mutants, most skeletons, even if they were of a high level, would easily fall into the predicament of being shattered by a single touch. Zombies were different. Their speciality was their thick skin. The undead's characteristics and the buffer effect of rotten meat gave ordinary zombies a defensive ability that skeletons lacked. As for the silver moon zombies, 
they were even stronger. Lastly, it was the attack ability. Skeleton soldiers had high attack power, but zombies had even higher attack power. Most zombies were born with the following two attributes. Unlimited strength, zombies' strength will not be lower than 15 points. Paralysis poison, during a battle with a zombie, living enemies will be paralyzed once every 30 seconds. Once the immunity roll fails, they may enter a paralyzed state for 3-5 seconds. The true weakness of zombies was their movement speed and attack speed. The speed at which they raised their hands and walked was so slow that their enemies could easily walk away. If a normal person's movement speed was 10, then the skeleton soldiers was 7, and the zombies were only 4. The slow movement and attack speed were the reasons why necromancers didn't like zombies. But the silver moon zombie was different. Thanks to the moonlight power the silver zombies could move around 6 points under the moon. Although it was still not fast, it was much faster than normal. At the same time, the increase in strength and the existence of the paralyzing poison also allowed the zombies to control their enemies better. I can learn one or two crowd control spells. Hmm, the level 5 spell frost. Path is not bad. It can work with zombies to kill the target. Matthew was in a good mood as he wandered around the zombies. He didn't even care that Eli's mind was about to explode. After getting familiar with the attributes and abilities of the zombie, Matthew's physical examination was ready to come to an end. It was a pity. None of the five zombies were elite zombies. According to Scarface's performance when he was alive, Matthew thought that he would become an elite, but who knew that he was only a normal zombie? However, the zombie that had been transformed from Scarface was indeed the tallest, largest, and strongest among them. To make it easier to remember, Matthew named it the Big Zombie. The remaining four sat in a row according to their physiques. Naturally, they were named Zombies 2 to 5. Chapter 49, Silver Moon Zombie Matthew was already very fond of his zombie underlings. After the naming was completed, Matthew began to drive the Silver Moon Zombies around the Oak Forest. He had to arrange accommodation for his new employees. The skeleton dormitory definitely wouldn't do. Although zombies and skeletons were both undead creatures, they were born to be enemies. If no one controlled them, a war would definitely break out between the two. Matthew did not want that to happen. He walked around the forest. In the end, he found a similar hole about 200 meters away from the skeleton dormitory. The tunnel was one way. It looked dark, narrow, and deep. Matthew ordered the zombies to jump down one by one. They did exactly as he said. Hmm, I can stuff another five. Tomorrow, I'll find a carpenter to get a few boards to cover the hole. From now on, this is the zombie dormitory. Matthew was about to leave. At this moment, Eli, who had been tailing them all the way, finally couldn't take it anymore. He asked angrily. Are you hiding the zombies here? Matthew spread his hands. Isn't that clear? Eli was even angrier. If not for his strong sense of principle, he really wanted to throw himself at the necromancer and scratch his handsome face. Since you like to mix undead creatures with nature so much, why don't you build a few new cemeteries in the forest? He mocked. Matthew's eyes lit up. He pondered for a few seconds. He pressed his hands on both sides of Eli's shoulders and praised sincerely, You're really a genius. I should have thought of it earlier. Matthew praised Eli several times. Only then did he let go of his hand and turn to leave. Wait. Eli suddenly felt something was wrong. What do you mean? I agree with you about a cemetery. If we build a super large cemetery in the oak forest, it might become a city of the undead in the future. Matthew's mind was filled with longing for the future. In the past, his attention on undead creatures was limited to some special targets, mainly Peggy, Philly and Soldier. He was limited by energy and negligence. He really did not think of building a real cemetery for the undead creatures to live in. This would not only greatly increase the loyalty of the employees, but there were also many other benefits. The cost of building a cemetery was not low. However, Matthew had already decided to build the cemetery in a hole under the forest. At this moment, the empty underground city in the Gold Digger Basin became the perfect graveyard. The undead rested underground. The oak tree grew above ground. What a beautiful and harmonious scene. Matthew decided to go back and discuss it with Peggy. If they wanted to build a cemetery, the opinion of the Tauran skeleton was undoubtedly the most important. His mind was filled with the enthusiasm to build a cemetery. 
Matthew returned to the cabin and was about to record his inspiration when a tall shadow appeared outside the window of the cabin. Peggy? Matthew looked at her in surprise, and his eyes gradually became nervous. What happened? In his agreement with Peggy. Only when something urgent happened would she leave home and come to the forest to look for Matthew. Peggy said seriously. Matthew, a young man who is ten times more beautiful than you found me. He said that he wanted to redeem me and let me go with him in the future. With the relationship between you and me, how could I agree? But he gave me a raise, so I thought I had to tell you before I eloped with him, so I came to you. Matthew rolled his eyes, his nervousness gone. Stop joking. Get to the point, Peggy he said. Peggy shrugged. All right, all right. There was a beautiful young man who came to our house today, but he came to look for you. I said you weren't there. He said he would come back tomorrow at the same time. He has something important to discuss with you. Matthew asked incredulously, did you come all the way here just for this? This doesn't suit your personality. Peggy said shyly, because of that beautiful young man, I hope that you receive this news as soon as possible. He even praised me for my temperament. Matthew was even more in disbelief. He didn't give you any other benefits. Peggy said unhappily, am I the kind of person who will accept random benefits? Could it not be due to love? To be honest, Matthew, the moment I saw that young man for the third time, I already thought of where to elope with him. Matthew rubbed his temples and suddenly said, I know who our mysterious guest is. Peggy said in surprise, have you guessed it? I was just about to tell you his identity, origin, and name. Zeller. Matthew shrugged. The warlock from the Lord's Mansion, the one who is inseparable from Riagar most of the time. In the entire Rolling Stone town, only he can be more handsome than me. He saw that Peggy was still smitten after nodding her head. Matthew couldn't help but tease, with his charm, who knows how many women he has fooled. You are not his match, Peggy. Who knew that Peggy actually replied very quickly, who knows. How many men have fooled around with a skeleton tauren before? Maybe he will find it fresh. Matthew was at a loss for words and could not find an angle to refute. After all, there was a high chance Zeller had never fooled around with a skeleton tauren before. 8 p.m. the next day. Matthew's living room. Coffee or milk? There's wine too, but they're all very bland. Facing Matthew's hospitality. Zeller casually put one thigh on the other Emmy. He had a confident and charming smile on his face. Chapter 50 Silver Moon Zombie. Thank you, just water will do. He was sitting comfortably on the sofa. It was completely different from the tension that many guests felt when they first visited. Every detail of Zeller's body showed that he was very relaxed. Tonight, he was wearing a thin purple short trench coat. With the black inner lining and long pants, the white belt was particularly eye catching. In the middle of the belt was a silver circle, and the pattern on it changed constantly. Goat horn, rainbow, Blade willow leaf, girl, farm bull, book, killer. Hanging on the right side of the belt were a few cute frog dolls. They looked vivid and lifelike. Matthew noticed this when he first entered the door. He couldn't help but take a few more glances. He had to admit. Zeller's handsomeness was from the inside out. If his appearance could only be considered above average, then his inner charm could drive most intelligent creatures crazy. This was a warlock. He was a professional charmer. This kind of charm ability feels just a little worse than Lulu's. Matthew was secretly shocked. On the other side. The attentive Peggy had already brought up the water that Zeller had ordered. However, Matthew felt his scalp go numb with just a glance. Peggy, why did you bring out the entire water tank from the kitchen? Peggy glared at him. What? I'm afraid that Zeller won't have enough to drink. Matthew was speechless. Peggy was indeed a mutant among mutants. Logically speaking, undead creatures were immune to charm, but she seemed to be mesmerized. But even so, Matthew still felt that she was acting. Are you that eager for a pay raise? Did I really give too little? He even thought of this. A small quarrel broke out between the master and servant. Zeller did not mind. He magically took out an empty bottle from his sleeve and filled it with water. Then, he used the same trick and grabbed a few pieces of ginger to sprinkle them into the cup. Ever since I awakened at the age of 13, I only drank this. Zeller explained with a smile. Matthew responded and finally thought of a way to send Peggy away. 
it was not until the figure of the Toran completely disappeared in front of the two that Zeller suddenly sighed. It's because of this that I don't want to go out and meet people. As he spoke, his eyes darted around Matthew's body teasingly. Mr. Matthew, other than Riagar, you were the first person to ignore my charm when you first met me completely. This is very impressive. Matthew waved his hand. Your over praises me. Your charm leaves a deep impression on me. Speaking. Of which, is there no way to restrain your charm? Zeller took a sip of cold ginger water. Yes. But I'm already in a state where I'm trying my best to restrain my charm. Matthew was silent. Charm that doesn't match one's strength is often the root of trouble. Zeller continued, I still remember that when I was 13 years old, I was sold to a big noble with a vast territory because I was too beautiful. That big-bellied middle-aged man kept saying that he wanted to take me as his adopted son. In the first week, he did a good job on the surface. He found someone to teach me how to read, taught me etiquette, and even bought me a pony to ride on. I was really happy at that time. I thought I had met a good person. That was until the day he undid his belt when we were alone in the room. He asked me to help him do it. Matthew couldn't help but ask, and then... Zeller smiled and said, then I awakened and became a warlock. Of course, this is the simplified version. In fact, there are a lot of complicated contents in the middle, but they can't be explained in a few words. Regardless, that's not the reason why I came to visit you today. Matthew nodded. Please speak. First of all, I want to thank you on behalf of Sif. I watched this child grow up. If anything happened to her that night, I would be very sad. Zeller said as he solemnly untied a frog doll hanging from his belt. He handed it to Matthew. A small gift. Please accept it. It might bring you luck. Matthew hesitated. In the end, he still took it. He rolled the doll in his palm and did not find anything unusual. So even you know the truth. Matthew asked casually. Zeller smiled gently. No one will really believe Blake's story about the necromancer of Bion City, right? Matthew coughed twice. However, it was Riagar who told me the true identity of that necromancer. Zeller added. In the next second. His expression turned serious. In that incident, the people who died at your hands belonged to the Order of Calamity, a newly rising evil organization. According to our latest intelligence, the Order of Calamity has no intention of stopping. They are recruiting more people to Harris Rolling Stone Town. Their primary target is you. Chapter 51, Unacceptable As far as Matthew knew, Zeller's position in the Lord's Manor was the head of intelligence and the person in charge OT matters related to adventurers. This person was deeply trusted by Riagar. This could be seen in the incident of Sift's kidnapping. Riagar had given Zeller full authority to deal with the matter of the spy. And Zeller was worthy of Riagar's trust. He rarely appeared outside of work, but he was always with Riagar. As long as the head of the Suki family appeared, one would be able to find Zeller within ten steps. Time passed. As a result, a ridiculous rumor even appeared in some small circles in Rolling Stone Town. Some people said that Zeller was a new lover that Riagar had found after he was betrayed by his wife. But Matthew felt that this was pure nonsense. He didn't find any signs of a couple between the two of them. Moreover, he had to be careful. From Sif, Matthew already knew that Zeller had followed Riagar before he married and had children. The two of them must have accumulated a pure and deep friendship over the years. The person who made up the rumor was probably jealous of Zeller's extraordinary status in the Lord's Manor, as well as his face that was enough to bring disaster to the country. Thanks for the reminder. Matthew put his hands together and said, So it was the Lord's intention for you to visit tonight. Zeller smiled gently. No. Riagar was not willing to let a necromancer interfere with the intelligence work of Rolling Stone Town, but I convinced him otherwise. Matthew gently clenched his fingers. What do you want me to do? He could tell that Zeller was implying something. Zeller reached his right hand into his left sleeve, and a high-quality craft envelope appeared between his index and middle fingers. He placed the envelope in front of Matthew and said unhurriedly. This is all the information. I'll tell you as you read. Matthew did not hesitate. The envelope wasn't sealed, and several thin pieces of paper slipped out after the red string was untied. Matthew glanced at the content and frowned slightly. It's a bit tricky, isn't it? Zeller gulped down a mouthful of cold ginger water. It would be fine if there were only one order of calamity, 
but I never thought that Rolling Stone Town would one day be targeted by three notorious evil organizations at the same time. The timing is too coincidental. I'm afraid even Blake wouldn't believe that none of them were organized and dispatched. Matthew looked at the three organizations mentioned in the intelligence that might attack Rolling Stone Town in the near future. The Order of Calamity. Silver Frost Brotherhood. Withering Order. What is even more ironic is that these three organizations actually sent threatening letters or challenges to us using their own names. Even the approximate time and place of the attack are written clearly. Are the current leaders of criminal organizations that unconventional? Or should we lament that Riyagar had kept a low profile for so many years that the outside world had forgotten the brutality and terror under the gentle appearance of the Suki family? Zeller spoke very calmly and steadily. However, when he said the last sentence, Matthew felt a surge of anger. He does seem to regard himself as a member of the Suki family. This thought flashed through Matthew's mind. His gaze quickly swept through all the words. Not long after, Matthew understood the situation. As you can see, the Southern Patriarch of the Order of Calamity has demanded that we hand over the murderer of their members and pay 50% of our annual tax as an annual tribute. Otherwise, they will raise Rolling Stone Town to the ground. The leader of the Silver Frost Brotherhood demanded that we hand over the two arsonists currently in the Rolling Stone Town prison and pay 60% of our annual tax as an annual tribute. They also wanted us to provide a stronghold for the Silver Frost Brotherhood to train reserve members. Finally, they even wanted us to send 50 women every year to solve the marriage problem of their members. As for the Withering Order, they were the easiest to talk to. They only asked for 30% of our taxes, and they only asked for the destruction of the forest around the town. Zeller still had a gentle smile on his face. These bandits are more familiar with extortion than the devils in purgatory. Matthew's expression was a little serious, and he looked a little more ruthless. Kin Rolling Stone Town deal with the invasion of three evil organizations at the same time. Zeller quickly said, we can resist the invasion, but we can't control the intermittent disturbance. Matthew instantly understood. The biggest headache when a territory encountered an evil organization was that the other party would not play the fair game. Evil organizations would more likely employ harassment tactics. The security situation in the territory would take a sharp turn in the short term. Not to mention Rolling Stone Town. Even a medium-sized city like Julia City wouldn't dare to say that they would survive this onslaught from all sides. Among the nearby cities, only Bion City and Jade Court had such strength. Of the three organizations, two of them are targeting me, and the remaining one is also related to me. Matthew pursed his lips. On the surface, that's the case, but in fact, without you, they will still launch a malicious attack on Rolling Stone Town. Zeller tapped his left and right knuckles with his right hand and said briskly. It's better to say that you have already helped us resolve an attack from them. Besides, with you around, Rolling Stone Town's resistance to evil has increased, so you don't have to have any other thoughts. As long as you are a resident of Rolling Stone Town, you will be protected by the Suki family, and the Suki family will never compromise with evil. Chapter 52, Unacceptable Matthew nodded. He believed Zeller. If the three major organizations only mentioned the time of their attack in their letters, then where did you get the detailed data on their number of members, their position structure, and their estimated strength? Matthew pointed at the rows of numbers on the report. That was the work of divination and scouts. Zeller explained. There have traces of any unusual movements. Actually, before I received the letter, I had already sent scouts to the surrounding cities to collect information. At that time, I found some clues. It is impossible for such a large number of people to move quietly. They need food, accommodation, and equipment. Matthew looked at him curiously. How did you think of sending people to other cities to investigate? Zeller explained patiently, for that, I have to mention the case of the mole that I was commissioned by Riagar to investigate. Matthew became more energetic. Have you found the mole? Zeller said with certainty, Vic. Balmer, also known as Little Balmer, was the son of Balmer Sr., one of the nine Imites who had fought together with Lord Rigor in Purgatory. Little Balmer was the same age as Sif, and he looked like a simple and honest little fatty. He had followed Sif's footsteps since he was young and considered himself her follower, so they had a good relationship. When he grew up, his father took him to the manor in the west for training, so he had less contact with Sif. This spring, he suddenly wrote a letter to Sif inviting her to the countryside. On the way, something happened to Sif. This guy or the mastermind behind him is very cunning, give me set up many errors to trace. 
by the time I truly locked onto him, half a month had already passed. When I went to Palmer Senior's manor, I could only regretfully say that there was no one alive in the entire manor. The original farmers, maids, gardeners, chefs, and even the entire family, including Palmer Senior, had all become bizarre creations. My men had no choice but to clean up the manor. I found some evil art master's manuscripts in Little Balmer's bedroom, and I can basically confirm that he was the culprit. To be honest, I held Little Balmer when he was born. His honest appearance was too deceptive. No one expected him to come into contact with evil arts, and the first thing he did after becoming an evil art master was to refine his father into a bizarre creation. I heard that Balmer Sr. was very strict when he trained his son. Perhaps Little Balmer's hatred came from this. But no matter what, he is still a menace. Unfortunately, he had escaped. While my men were searching for Little Balmer, they accidentally learned that an evil organization was recruiting soldiers in Jilio City. After my divination confirmed this information, it became more comprehensive. Of course, the value of this information was quickly reduced because they directly issued a challenge. Zeller calmly told him the ins and outs of the matter. Finally. He added seriously, Palmer Sr. was a very good person, loyal and brave. It's just that he's a bit too old. Ruger and I have neglected him. If we had paid more attention to his recent situation, he might not have been harmed by his. Matthew was also angry. So, not only is that little Balmer still alive, but he might even return to Rolling Stone Town when the three major organizations take action. Zeller nodded slightly. Theoretically, that's possible. Perhaps he was the one who lured the Order of Calamity here in the first place, or perhaps he was just the most suitable breakthrough point the Order found in Rolling Stone Town. However, all of this did not matter. The important thing is how should we deal with it. Before I share my plan. I need your opinion. Matthew thought for a few minutes and replied. Since the three organizations have sent their letters of challenge separately, it means that they are not united internally. The best strategy is to divide them and defeat them one by one. The Withering Order has the most concentrated target, so we just have to make a fuss around the Oak Forest to lure them into taking the bait. Weren't there still two arsonists in the Silver Frost Brotherhood in prison? We just need to find the right time to let them escape successfully. After they escape, there is a high chance that they will go to the organization. We'll only need to follow them. I don't have any idea about the Order of Calamity. The fact that they dared to come to me after Fine's death proved that they have the ability to fight against Bone Dragons. The evil priest's methods are evil and impossible to guard against. However, there is one thing worth noting. They were very concerned about the bloodline of the Suki family, so Sif and Riagar are the key characters. They could also be used as bait to lure the snake out of its hole, but doing so would be risky. Zeller showed a look of approval after hearing this. Your reactions and ideas are top-notch. Most of your ideas are in line with my plan in the second stage. Matthew was a little surprised. Second stage. Yes, we will do what you said, but not now. Zeller explained. At this stage, the people from the three major organizations are probably infiltrating in batches. They must be extremely vigilant at this moment and won't be easily lured in. Evil forces were gathering in Rolling Stone Town. But at the same time. Our savior is also on the road. Only three of the nine knights who fought in Purgatory remained in Rolling Stone Town. One of them died, one retired, and only one who could fight was left. The rest went out for adventures. We have already written to them for help. As long as these people receive the letter, they will definitely return. Chapter 53, I Can T Accept It I've also sent people to the east to look for an old acquaintance of mine, who is a monk whose strength is close to legendary. With him around, the safety of Rolling Stone Town would be more secure. In addition, I also used my connections to call for a few old friends to come and help me. Even Mr. Richard couldn't help but send a letter to Northland. Look, our connections are actually not weak. All we need is time. Matthew reacted quickly. So your first phase plan is mainly to stall for time. Zeller said bluntly. I want you to pretend to be great mage Ronan. Matthew was shocked. Then, he nodded and said, it's not impossible. At this moment. Peggy, who had been eavesdropping for a long time, finally poked her head out from under the windowsill. Won't Ronan be unhappy if he finds out? Zeller and Matthew answered almost at the same time he won't. He might even find it interesting. The two of them looked at each other and smiled. They chatted for more than an hour. At night. 
Matthew walked Zeller to the fence. The two of them walked on the stone path in the garden. Zeller, who was walking in front, suddenly smiled and turned around. Mr. Matthew, please forgive me for playing a little trick at the beginning of the conversation in order to gain your trust. The story about the awakening of the warlock is not my own, but I heard it from another warlock friend. I deliberately made myself sound miserable so that I could gain your sympathy and pave the way for convincing you. But now, it seems that this is unnecessary. You're the kind of person I like. Matthew was stunned at first, and then he immediately heaved a sigh of relief. That's good. At least you didn't experience such a painful thing. A strange light flashed in Zeller's eyes. You are a strange necromancer. Your kindness is heartwarming. I'm sorry again for lying to you before. However, speaking of pain, my awakening experience was actually much more tragic than my friend's. As he spoke, he came to the fence and elegantly closed the door. However, I won't tell my story unless I'm on my deathbed. Oval.com Good night, Matthew. After her sending Zeller off. Matthew was in the living room sorting out the information he had obtained tonight. Then, he rushed back to the oak forest to take care of the place. He had to talk to Eli about the Withering Order. The Witherer was the archenemy of the Druids. Eli definitely knew more about this organization than he did. However, before that. After a week of hard work. He had already accumulated the capital for another ten strengthening buffs. The crisis was approaching. This was the time when he needed immediate combat strength. Therefore, Matthew deposited all the buffs he had to strengthen soldier. Hint, you have consumed ten strengthening buffs. Your summoned creature. Soldiers, has leveled up to level twelve. Its overall attributes have increased. Your summoned creature, soldier, has obtained seven keywords. Two of them are white, one is blue, two are purple, and the remaining two are gray. My luck isn't very good. Matthew sighed. The two gray ones were really a headache. He glanced over. As usual, he looked at the weaker keywords first. Backstab, white when your skeleton attacks the enemy from behind, the damage and stun duration will be greatly increased. Sprint, white your skeleton's movement speed in battle has been greatly increased. Storm combo, blue when your skeleton uses a short knife as a weapon and successfully hits the enemy's vital points, it can make a second and third slash in a very short time as a combo. This process will cause a lot of damage. The quality was surprisingly good. It wasn't particularly powerful. However, it was solid and useful. At least it's not some strange abilities. Matthew then looked at the purple keyword. Colorful dance, purple when your skeleton uses this dance, it can leave an afterimage wherever it goes. During the duration of the dance, regardless of its current position and state, it can instantly return to the position of the afterimage. Currently, the maximum number of afterimages that can be left is, 4. Fake death, purple your skeleton has learned the exquisite skill of faking death, which is enough to deceive most creatures. When your skeleton leaves the state of fake death, its next three normal attacks will deal a lot of extra damage. It is finally back to normal. Matthew was greatly comforted. One of the two purple keywords provided high mobility, while the other provided sinister killing moves. He didn't understand how a skeleton could fake his death. But Soldier naturally had a way. At this point, uncoordinated Gray, in non-combat mode, Soldier has developed bad coordination in his extremities. This is also okay. Matthew heaved a sigh of relief. However, in the next second, his expression changed slightly. Work awareness, Gray your skeleton has developed the awareness that it is creating value for you. This awareness is not strong and is even a little humble. Every three months, you need to pay one soul crystal to appease Soldier, which will give him a great incentive. This. It's a little unacceptable. Matthew subconsciously gave himself a face palm. Soldier looked at him blankly. After a while, he actually imitated Matthew and used his bone palm to hold his face. The scene was both funny and strange. Eli flashed out from behind the house and stared at Matthew seriously. What position is this? Are you trying to summon some evil creatures in front of me again? Chapter 54, Intelligence Mystery Lock Eli? I was just looking for you. Matthew quickly threw this small annoyance to the back of his mind. He said to Eli, you mentioned before that you once confronted a witherer in the forest. Eli nodded solemnly. Quinna, that's her name. Quinna was once an outstanding human druid, 
but she was abandoned by the nature soul after failing three advancement rituals. As a result, she became resentful and angry at nature and turned against nature. She joined the Witherers as you know it. There were still some things he did not say. In recent years, more and more Druids had turned into Witherers. This was a bad sign. The Druids are defecting at an accelerated rate while a necromancer is busy planting trees. This world is really crazy. This was what Eli was thinking. Matthew nodded slightly. As far as I know, there's an organization called the Withering Order that has its eyes on this place. He said, if possible, please tell me more information about them. Eli muttered. The Witherers gathered together to form the Withering Order. I don't know the details of this organization, but I know that the Witherers usually don't appear in big organizations. They often form groups of two or three to carry out destructive actions. The Witherers obtain power from destroying the forest. If there were too many people, the power that each Witherer received would be very diluted. However, Witherers rarely went solo. They would only go deep into the forest alone when they held an evil advancement ritual. As he spoke, his eyes look around for a long time. He gave a very confident answer. I don't think there will be more than four of them. If there are more than four of them, they won't get any benefits even if they destroy all of your oak trees. Also, I'm guessing that the Witherer that's with her should be around Tier 3, with the highest being level 12. This is because every Tier 4 Witherer is a walking tree plague. There is an unconcealable rotten halo on their bodies. As long as they appear, I can smell them from 200 miles away. Four level 12 Witherers? Matthew was confident. Seeing Matthew's thoughtful expression, Eli puffed out his chest proudly. You don't have to worry about this. I told you that I would help you chase away those Witherers. Although I'm only at Tier 3, if we were to fight head-on, even four Witherers combined would definitely not be my match. Matthew believed in this word. The shapeshifter route that Eli took was the most powerful branch among the mid-level Druids, not to mention that he had mastered the powerful ancient tiger form. Matthew felt that it might have been the appearance of Eli that delayed the Witherer's attack. Otherwise, he and the Witherers would have fought long ago. Thank you, Eli. You've been a great help. Matthew said seriously, but I'm thinking about how to catch all these. Witherers in one go. After all, we can't be on the defensive forever. Hearing this, Eli showed an expression of agreement. If you want to draw them out, I can hide in one of the caves nearby. However, there can't be any undead in there. I can't stand being in the same cave as zombies or skeletons. Matthew waved his hand. There's no rush. If they're really patient, let them continue to observe. During this period, I'll make sufficient preparations. By the way, you seem to have something to tell me just now. Matthew noticed that this was the first time Eli had voluntarily approached his cabin. As expected. Eli said seriously, the food you brought this morning tasted very good. The sausages and bread were unbelievably well cooked, and the cup of milk with honey was equally memorable, so I came to thank you. Matthew smiled. All the credits go to Peggy. Eli's eyes lit up. Matthew muttered, uh, Peggy is indeed a good woman. Eli pretended to be reserved and said, then, please send my regards to Miss Peggy. Tell her that I'm looking forward to tomorrow's food. If there's a chance, I wish to talk to her face to face. After her saying that. He swaggered off. Matthew was left alone, struggling to decide what expression he should show. In the wooden house. Matthew examined Soldier's body. After going through 28 enhancements. Soldier's level had already reached level 12. The Blade Dancer's outstanding profession had given him an extremely strong assassination ability. Matthew speculated that Soldier would become a nightmare for all frail adventurers. Just a little bit more. I still have to plant a few more trees. Once he broke through to Tier 4, he would become a more useful companion than fully. Matthew gently caressed Soldier's strong spine. At this moment, a thin layer of dark red fibers had already grown on the bones in the core area of the chest and spine. They were tightly attached to the silver-yellow high-quality bones. Under the illumination of the fire, it gave off a mysterious and demonic aura. Chapter 55, Intelligence Mystery Lock At the same time, the cloak on his back also became bigger and thicker. The Dark Knight cloak was originally just a pitch black cloth, but now there were two pieces of red velvet material at the bottom and around the neck. Soldier now looked like a big shot. Matthew thought for a moment and decided to change Soldier's contract to a more advanced one. The current soldier was the same as the other skeleton soldiers. 
he had signed a temporary contract with Matthew. He could be summoned and abandoned at any time. The advantage of this contract was that it was cheap. However, it was not conducive to the long-term tacit understanding between the necromancer and the summoned creature. Matthew had been watching to see how Soldier could be strengthened. Now, he felt that Soldier was qualified enough to use up one of his contract slots. In the future, Soldier, like Peggy and Philly, would become Matthew's exclusive contracted undead summon. Contract replacement successful. Your contract slot I, exclusive contract creature plus one. Current number of contracts, three-fifths. You have paid one soul crystal as a reward for Soldier's hard work for the next three months. Your summoned creature, Soldier, is extremely grateful. His loyalty to you has increased to 105. Thanks to your discerning eyes, great nurturing, and generous funding, Soldier has shared his ability, Dark Knight Cloak, with you. Dark Knight Cloak, weakened you can enter a strong invisibility state anytime and anywhere. After entering the invisibility state, you cannot be selected and cannot be attacked. But there is a possibility of being accidentally injured by ranged attacks. Duration 45 seconds. I've practically raised soldier myself. It's much kinder than fully. Matthew was very emotional. Dark Knight Cloak was soldier's trump card. This was one of the few abilities Matthew could use. Although there was a time limit and its effects were weakened compared to the original version, it was still an excellent escape skill. At least it was much stronger than the invisibility ring that Matthew had obtained before. Immediately. Matthew tried it a few times in the room. After activating the Dark Knight Cloak, he felt as if he had entered the water. He was surrounded by a sticky, flowing medium. There was a deep barrier between him and the material world. However, it could be broken at any time. Compared to the invisibility ring, which limited his movement when hidden, Matthew could walk at normal speed under the Dark Knight Cloak. Matthew even deliberately walked towards Eli. The ancient tiger's senses were indeed sharp. He jumped up at once, his nose twitching. Then, he lay back down lazily. Next time, remember to take a shower or apply perfume. Eli proudly commented, I've long remembered your scent. Necromancer, your invisibility might not be bad, but I've said it before, we druids are the kings of the jungle. Matthew shrugged and walked away. He believed that not everyone had a sensitive nose like Eli's. Next, he tested the cooldown time of the Dark Knight Cloak. Seven minutes. The Dark Knight Cloak could only be used for a second time after seven minutes. This was a little too long. However, considering that this was an ability that had been exchanged with a soul crystal, Matthew was still feeling contented. Matthew returned to the Moonlight Woodlands. Somewhere in the third level of the underground hive. A strong wind blew. It blew away the thick pile of fallen leaves on the ground, revealing the ghastly white bones of varying degrees of decay underneath. Samantha stood at the edge of the tunnel and said, these corpses have already been purified. You don't have to worry about whether they are still infected by the violent Zerg. Matthew nodded. He didn't waste any time and immediately began to summon his underlings. Not long after, a group of skeleton soldiers who were trembling but still full of spirit appeared in front of Matthew. A total of twelve. This was the maximum number of undead creatures Matthew could maintain, not counting exclusive contract summons. The maximum number of summoned creatures could be increased. Once he completed his next advancement, then the number would be 18, which was the current number plus 6. In most cases, the maximum number of summoned creatures of a necromancer strictly followed this formula. Only a few people could break through the limit. They had either mastered the relevant powers, had ancient artifacts, or were legends. The undead calamity was not so easy to activate. Most necromancers lived their long lives cautiously. They were no different from ordinary mages. Maybe even poorer. Samantha informed Matthew through Ella that she had yet to organize all the information she had collected about the So country, but she could take Matthew to replenish the skeleton soldiers first. Considering the impending storm in Rolling Stone Town, Matthew agreed. While controlling the unfamiliar skeletons, he pretended to ask casually, Why don't I see Eli? Samantha said coldly, I've already broken up with him. Matthew was shocked. Wait. You two were a couple. It didn't seem like it. It didn't look like it at all. Matthew recalled some of the details and scenes he had seen when he met the two of them. He would believe it if it was said that Eli was interested in Samantha, but to say that they were a couple. Which couple was so unfamiliar with each other? Samantha didn't seem to want to talk too much about this topic. 
Chapter 56, Intelligence Mystery Lock Yes, we were together for a short time, but we separated again. Matthew's heart skipped a beat. The scenes from that day surfaced in his mind. Combined with the time that Eli appeared in the oak forest. He had a general understanding of the cause and effect, but he suddenly admired Eli even more. What kind of person do you think Eli is, he asked again. Samantha thought for a moment and said, he is a good man, but he is not suitable for me. He is kind, upright, and strong. That was good. However, he is too controlling. When I was with him, I often thought that I was just his vassal. This feeling was unpleasant, so it was only a matter of time before I separated from him. Matthew nodded. But it sounds like you two could still remain friends. Samantha said with uncertainty, maybe, but he's very proud, and he'll probably misunderstand the intention. Why are you asking so many questions? Are you interested in Eli? She looked at Matthew with white eyes. Matthew quickly waved his hand and said, no way. He was still wondering if he should tell Samantha that her ex-boyfriend was working for him. Samantha casually said goodbye. That's it then. I've already replenished the skeleton soldiers for you. If you need more corpses, go to the other layers of the tree pits. They're all corpses that Eli and I have purified. As she spoke, she transformed into a leopard. As for the information about the So country, I will sort it out for you as soon as possible. Thank you for your domain enlightenment. Then, goodbye, Matthew. As she spoke, she ran away. Looking in that direction, she was heading deep into the hive alone. Even now, she's still unwilling to cooperate with me. What a stubborn woman. He looked at Samantha's back as she left. Matthew shook his head slightly. At this moment, Ella, who had been wilting for a few days, flapped her wings excitedly. Matthew, Matthew. Now that you have a strong army, are you finally ready to start a massacre? Matthew asked in surprise, how can you tell that I have a strong army? The quality of these skeletons is obviously ordinary, and they are not as experienced as my previous ones. Ella begged, then let's kill at least two zergs today before leaving. Matthew nodded reluctantly. Fine. However, before the threat of the witherer was resolved, he really did not want to spend too much effort on other aspects. Three minutes later, they watched as a newborn skeleton clumsily destroyed a new nest by the side of the road and successfully killed two violent zerg larvae that had come out of it. Matthew immediately aid to Ella with a pleasant expression. Can we call it a day now? Ella lowered her head and was speechless. The next day, at the Craftsman Protection Association building, Matthew walked briskly through the hall. Following the front desk lady's guidance, he stepped up the stairs and walked towards the third floor. However, when he passed by the second floor, Matthew suddenly stopped and walked towards the locksmith's office. Just like last time, the office door was still half open. Behind the desk was a middle-aged gentleman reading a book. Do you have another lock that needs to be unlocked? This time, Richard did not hide it. He had already cast his gaze on Matthew before he approached the door. No, I'm here to look for a blacksmith, so I came to see you since I was passing by. Matthew said with a smile. As he spoke, he took out some fruits from the bags in his hand and placed them on the table. The person in front of him was a rogue of the fifth tier or above. It was definitely not wrong to have a good relationship with him. Richard sneered. You don't have to do that. I've seen too many things when I was young. Some fruits can't buy me over. Tell me, what do you want me to help you with? Matthew smiled helplessly and walked out. I'm really just passing by. I'll leave now. Wait. Richard stopped Matthew. He glanced at the fruits on the table and asked, What are you looking for a blacksmith for? Matthew explained, I need to entrust someone to forge two short knives. Short knives. Richard looked at Matthew suspiciously. Did you summon an assassin? The man was very sharp. Matthew knew that he couldn't hide it from Richard, so he simply admitted it. Congratulations. At least in the middle and lower levels, having a rogue by your side will be very useful. Richard closed the book. But you've come to the wrong place. There are many excellent craftsmen in the association, but there are very few excellent blacksmiths. I don't think I can recommend you to anyone. Matthew frowned slightly. Fortunately, he knew that excellent blacksmiths were scarce, so he only came to try his luck today. Do I have to go to Julia City or Bian City? Before Matthew could ask the question, 
Richard picked up the pen and wrote a few words. However, I can introduce someone to you. Everyone calls him Old Fallon, and he's the vice president of the Veterans Association. He once followed Riagar into purgatory, and he's very skilled in forging. He hasn't been open to the public for many years, but I can try to help you get in touch with him. Matthew took the recommendation letter and thanked him. Richard waved his hand and said seriously. This is not free help, Matthew. Zeller must have told you about the challenge letter from the three major organizations. This is very unusual. I need you to think about it. Think about it seriously. Have you ever seen such behavior in history or in a book? Don't be in a hurry to answer me. Take a deep breath. Think. Seek your memories. You're the only one among us who can think of it. I mean, if something like this really happened in history. Richard's words sounded strange. But Matthew tried to follow his words. A few seconds later. A stunned expression appeared on his face. I did remember something. What's going on? Matthew was extremely surprised. There was indeed a large chunk of related content in his mind. But before that. It was as if they did not exist in his memory. That's a curse that the gods placed before they left, Matthew. Richard's voice seemed to come from the clouds. A lot of profound, useful knowledge, important, and accessible history has been hidden by the curse called Intelligence Lock. Even if it has lingered in the minds of many people, only those with 15 points of intelligence and above, especially mages, have the chance to recall it. That's why I told you that this world is ultimately the world of spellcasters. You were born to be spared from one of the three great curses left behind by the gods. How can you not be favored by the heavens? Now, tell me, what do you remember? Chapter 57, Ursel's Cries Intelligence Lock When this word appeared in Matthew's mind, it was as bright as the newborn sun. The haze of memories was swept away. A part of the knowledge that was originally like the fog became clear. He held his forehead with one hand and reminisced. A ritual. I read in a book that an evil organization issued a declaration of war before invading a certain territory. This is the beginning of a ritual called plunder. This ritual originated in the Age of Enlightenment when the gods were divided into two camps, good and evil. The Age of Enlightenment. It was an era when the gods dominated the human world with their own power. At that time, the internal conflicts among the gods were very serious. They were generally divided into two camps, one good and one evil, attacking each other. After many years of development, the children of the good gods controlled the towns and villages, while the believers of the evil gods wandered in the wilderness and ruins. In order to please the god they served, the followers of the evil god would often attack and plunder towns and villages on a regular basis. Before this, they would hold a grand activation ceremony which included spreading fear, that is, spreading a declaration of war to the target town and creating a large number of rumors of impending disaster. Through this action, they would have the opportunity to disrupt the situation in the target town in advance, which would reduce the resistance to their subsequent attacks. Even if they could not achieve this goal perfectly, they could still gain the favor of the god they believed in through the ritual itself. This would allow them to obtain stronger evil power. So, the act of issuing a letter of challenge is not only the beginning of the plundering ritual but also a part of the activation ritual. Richard asked seriously. Matthew nodded. If they are indeed imitating the believers of the evil god in the Age of Enlightenment, then there is a high chance that they will do two more things to complement the activation ritual completely. The first was to create an iconic event. The impact of this event must be great, and the outcome must be tragic. It would be best if it could be linked to something that the residents of the town were familiar with. Then, they would publicize the tragedy of this case, spreading panic. Once this was done, the activation ceremony was officially completed. In the Age of Enlightenment, the evil gods would bestow a large number of divine blessings at this stage as a reward, and also to pave the way for the subsequent official plundering ritual. Richard said approvingly, Look, I knew you could do it. This information is a big help. I'll go straight to Zeller and tell him about this. Matthew thought for a moment. If the intelligence lock really exists, won't you soon forget about this too? Richard smiled peacefully. Theoretically, yes, but that's something that happened in a higher dimension. If we deliberately remember these things, we won't forget them in the short term. The curse of the gods isn't that powerful. The terrifying thing about it is that it's pervasive. Besides, if something leaves a deep impression on you, so deep that you will never forget it, then the curse will not be able to do anything to you. 
it's like I shouldn't have remembered the intelligence lock, but I knew it existed because. I have a deep impression of it. Matthew nodded thoughtfully. He noticed that when Richard said these words, although its tone was very calm, there was always a strange look in its eyes. This was exactly the same as when he said, this world is ultimately the world of spellcasters. Matthew guessed that this retired rogue had a story that he could not forget. There was a high chance that this story was related to the spellcaster and the intelligence lock. The two of them then exchanged some secrets that might be hidden behind the plundering ritual. Richard believed that the actions of the three major organizations were not just imitating the ritual. They would definitely be able to draw strength from the activation ritual. As for the source of this power, it was still difficult to determine whether it was the void ruler Yurkos that Matthew had previously discovered in the secret letter or an evil god who had been hiding his strength for many years and suddenly made a high-profile comeback. At least we can predict Pnelr next move in advance. Richard got up and carefully tidied up his clothes. I'll go find Zeller now. If it's convenient, you'd better go to the Lord's residence tomorrow. This is to prevent the most extreme situation from happening, which is that both Zeller and I have forgotten about this matter. Matthew agreed. But do I just go to the Lord's manor like that? Would Riagar have any objections? He asked. Richard glanced at him. Why would Riagar object? His daughter has been clamoring every day to go to your house for tutoring. Now that you are going to him, it's much safer for him. In my opinion, he will pay you to be Sif's tutor sooner or later. Just treat it as familiarizing yourself with your future work environment in advance. When he left the Craftsman Protection Association, Matthew was still memorizing the knowledge he had lost and regained. The feeling of forgetting at any time was terrible. He could only deepen it repeatedly and planned to jot down everything related to the intelligence lock in his daily manuscripts when he went back. He passed through two busy streets. The crowd gradually became deserted. Matthew came to the front of a house in the northern part of the region. Compared to the Craftsman's Protection Association's building, the house seemed to have been in disrepair for a long time. Perhaps because it had been in a fire, the walls of the facade were covered in black spots. Chapter 58, Ursel's Reprimand A few Boston ivy covered it, and the white and pink flowers added some vitality to this slightly desolate low building. The wooden door was half open. On the grass in front of the door was a set of mailboxes and a wooden sign that said Veterans Association. Matthew leaned over. He first rang the bell for a while and only walked in steadily after making sure that no one answered. Behind the door was an open and cold front hall. The air was filled with the faint smell of herbs. A few rough stone pillars appeared in front of him, and the reception area was empty. I can't see anything. It was clearly early in the morning, but it gave Matthew the illusion that it was getting late. Is anyone there? He lowered his voice and shouted twice. After a while. The sound of footsteps could be heard coming from the spiral staircase. A tiger appeared at the end OT the stairs. The man had a head full of white hair and was old, but his pace was fast and steady. He was very tall and had to hold the handrail to maintain his balance when he went down the stairs, but his back was always straight, and his posture was perfect. I'm old Fallon. Who are you looking for? The old man came in front of Matthew and sized him up with his turbid eyes. His tone was neither servile nor overbearing. Matthew immediately showed Richard's recommendation letter. My name is Matthew. I'm here to look for you. My friend needs a pair of weapons. Old Fallon took the letter silently. Then he opened the wooden door to the maximum, allowing more sunlight to seep in. Then, he took out a monocle wrapped in layers of blue velvet from his shirt pocket and began to read carefully. Mr. Matthew. Old Fallon meticulously put away the monocle and said in a very formal tone. I'm already very old. I'm afraid I don't have the strength to forge a new weapon for your friend. Matthew had actually given up hope the moment he saw old Fallon. He looked at least 70 years old. Indeed, he did not seem to be at the age where he could start forging at any time. However, I had collected many weapons when I was young. For Richard's sake, I am willing to sell one of them to you. Old Farron continued, the current problem is that I need to know your friend's profession, usage requirements, and various habits. It would be best if he could come here in person and let me see his hands. Otherwise, it will be difficult for me to choose a suitable weapon for him. Matthew thought for a moment and reminded. My friend, he is not human. Old Fallon's expression did not change. That changes nothing. Matthew nodded. The old man in front of him had also fought his way out of purgatory with rigor. He definitely had some knowledge and experience, 
so he naturally wouldn't make a fuss out of it. Hence, he thought for a moment and summoned soldier. The light of the contract flashed. A skeleton hidden under a dark red cloak appeared silently. Skeleton? Can you order him to walk a few steps for me? Old Fallon's eyes lit up with surprise. Matthew ordered soldier to cooperate. The latter subconsciously twisted his hips as he walked. Old Fallon couldn't help but laugh. Is it actually the blade dancer? This is the first time I've seen a dead spirit retain the skills of a blade dancer. It's unbelievable. Matthew was delighted. He knew that he had met an expert today, so he hurriedly asked, Are you familiar with the profession of blade dancer? Old Fallon thought about it. I'm not familiar with it. I just had a good time with an understanding blade dancer. Unfortunately, we didn't end up together. As he spoke. He seemed to see the curiosity in Matthew's eyes, so he took the initiative to add. The blade dancer is a special profession in the Thousand Sails archipelago. The dancers there perfectly combine dance and sword techniques, creating an incredible way of killing. Most of the time, the blade dancers were female, but their leader was most likely a male. In my memory, the leader of the blade dancer was close to the tier of legendary power. The blade dancer had extremely strong assassination abilities. They were one of the two most terrifying rogue advancements in the endless ocean. Matthew asked curiously, what about the other one? Ninja. A strange syllable came out of Old Fallon's throat. Just like the sword dancer, the ninjas were created by the Icelanders to protect themselves. In the past few decades, you could see many sword dancers and ninjas in Gem City and Dragon Bay. However, since the incident of the evil dragon in the sea, the islands they lived on were overturned or submerged by endless waves. Now, it is very difficult to see these two kinds of advanced rogues. Matthew secretly noted it down. Soldier didn't respond to the old man's description. He just kept twisting his hips. He twisted and twisted. His figure suddenly disappeared. If Matthew hadn't given the order to reveal himself in time, he would have twisted himself away to oblivion. He shows a very deep soul instinct. He must have been a very outstanding blade dancer when he was alive. He might even be someone I knew. Old Fallon's eyes were filled with emotion. With Matthew's help, he grabbed soldiers' hands and examined them. I know what weapon to choose for you. Please follow me. Old Fallon led Matthew up the stairs. He took two steps. He suddenly stopped and asked. You can summon skeleton soldiers with the inheritance of the blade dancer, and you have a letter of recommendation from Richard. You must be the rumored necromancer with the bone dragon, right? Chapter 59, Ursul's Reprimand Why did these people know so much? Matthew smiled helplessly. He could only nod and admit it. You saved Sif, and I'm very grateful to you. Previously, Riagar was unwilling to tell me your true identity, which made me very angry. Old Fallon said seriously. Come on, child. I have a gift for you. Matthew followed Old Fallon up to the third floor. When they passed by the second floor, the smell of herbs suddenly thickened. There were many rooms on the second floor. The smell came from these rooms. Matthew glanced at them and vaguely saw a few figures lying on rattan chairs. They were all survivors of the snake hunt. At that time, more than 200 night servants went to Winter Snake Valley with us. In the end, less than 50 people survived. More than 30 of them died less than five years after they settled in. Rolling Stone Town. These are the remaining 20 people. Old Fallon explained. The poison fog of the Purgatory Viper is very terrifying. They only touched the edge of the poison fog and were already left with a permanent illness. Fortunately, Riagar was a good person and was willing to spend money to support them. These herbs were not helpful for their illness and could even be addictive, but they could more or less relieve some pain. As they spoke, Matthew also heard a few helpless and suppressed wails from behind the doors. He hesitated and said, Even the great mage Ronan can't do anything about it. Old Fallon glanced at him. Ronan is a good person, but he doesn't necessarily care about everything. As they spoke, they came to the third floor. Old Fallon led them to an empty conference room to wait. Then, he left. About twenty minutes later. The sound of wooden planks trembling could be heard from the stairs. Matthew looked over. Old Fallon walked in with two heavy boxes, one big and one small. Matthew was about to step forward. However, he was stopped by the other party's gaze. Don't worry. I'm not that old yet. He placed the two boxes on the ground, and then opened the copper lock on one of them. 
he lifted the long and narrow velvet cloth, and two exquisitely shaped, rounded short knives appeared in front of Matthew. Try it. Old Fallon skillfully picked up a knife with each index finger of his hands. In the next second, he flicked his fingers. The dagger spun and flew towards Soldier. Soldier still looked dull and sluggish. However, at the moment the short blades closed in on him. His hands were as steady as a magnet as he grabbed the two knives. He held his two blades and quickly retreated a large distance. Then, he involuntarily danced in a very rhythmic dance. Your summoned soldier likes the weapon you gave him very much. His loyalty to you has increased to 115. In gratitude for your gift, soldier shared his ability, step back. Step back, through a tactical move, you can quickly pull back a distance to get rid of the opponent's entanglement. Good heavens, in love with the new weapon so soon? Matthew didn't know whether to laugh or cry. He hadn't even paid for the item, but soldier had already shared his ability in advance. Was he forcing Matthew to get the two blades for him? It looks like he likes it very much. There was a hint of gratification in Old Fallon's tone. This pair of daggers are called Firefly and Bright Moon. They were forged by a great grey dwarf craftsman. Its former owner was a highly skilled drow assassin, who was an impressive woman. Matthew looked at him thoughtfully. Are you very familiar with her? Old Fallon said calmly. I can't say that we're familiar with each other. We just had some good times together. Unfortunately, we didn't end up together. Matthew felt that these words were extremely familiar. Old Farron continued. Firefly and Bright Moon themselves don't have any particularly outstanding enchantment effects, but their quality and sharpness are excellent enough. In the hands of the right person, their lethality is not inferior to that of a semi-divine weapon. In terms of abilities, Firefly could increase the time of stealth and the speed of attack. Bright Moon, on the other hand, would provide a large amount of additional damage when an attack combo was in effect. In short, they are the best daggers in my hands. If it weren't for Richard's introduction and the fact that you saved Sif, I wouldn't sell them to you. Matthew suddenly had a toothache. Old Fallon had already said that he would sell and not gift the weapon to him. Then this pair of daggers would definitely not be cheap. As expected. When he asked about the price. This veteran, who had always maintained a meticulous temperament, revealed a rare hint of profiteering. 800 gold coins, no bargaining. Matthew shook his head gently. This price was too high, far beyond what he could afford. He had a budget of 200 gold. The difference between the two was three times. You can also rent it. Old Fallon suggested. I know that the price is a little high, but a rogue's weapon is no cheaper than a mage's weapon. It's not easy to find such a weapon on the market, let alone in Rolling Stone Town. You might not even be able to find a weapon of the same quality in Jilio City or Bian City. If you want to rent it, you only need to pay 10 coins per month, but you need to pay the first two years rent in advance. You can pay the rest slowly. I also need collateral like title deed or real estate. Matthew quietly pulled the pair of short knives from Soldier's hands. I still need to think about it. He put the knife back into the box. There's no hurry. You have plenty of time to think. Old Fallon smiled apologetically. Actually, I also want to sell it to you at a low price, but as you can see, our situation here is not good. I can't ask Riagar for money every year. Matthew nodded in understanding. Old Fallon opened another box. Inside was a long and thin whip. Try it. The old man said gently. This is the gift I mentioned before. It represents my gratitude. Matthew took the whip. He used his hand to stroke the snake-scale-like whip gently. A new message flashed before his eyes. You have obtained the necromancer's exclusive weapon, Ursul's Reprimand. Ursul's Reprimand, Whip. Description, this whip is usually used against undead creatures. When you wave this whip at an enemy undead creature, it is equivalent to applying the effects of Dispel Undead and Reprimand Undead to the target unit. It has a very high priority in dispelling undead creatures. When wielding this whip against your own undead, your undead will lose a small amount of soul fire and receive a random powerful buff. Remark, some undead creatures are easily addicted to the lash of the whip. When using it, please pay attention to the state of their soul fire. Don't go overboard. Chapter 60, I'm with him. This weapon is very special. Matthew could feel a cold power contained in it. It was different from the negative energy that was destructive and violent. It was more like a power that went straight to the soul. 
For ordinary people, it might just be a prop that could be used to dispel the undead. However, in the hands of a necromancer with many summons, it would have a chance to shine even more brilliantly. Of course, the previous owner of this weapon, Ursul, was a bad-tempered necromancer. Her reputation was once known by everyone in the Great Swamp. People said that the undead under her command had all kinds of incredible abilities. At first, I thought that this was because of her brilliant magic, but later I found out that this was the real reason. Old Fallon sighed and said. When she died, she entrusted me to find a good owner for this weapon. However, a few years later, the incident with Riagar happened, and I sealed this whip. Matthew was stunned. You and the previous owner of this whip also had a good time together? A female necromancer. Old Fallon raised his eyebrows. Do I look like a person who'd sleep around? Matthew hurriedly shook his head. Ursul and I are just good friends. Of course, she might have had some interest in me when she was young, but at that time, my standards were still high. All I was interested in were princesses from a small country or some rich ladies. I would rather waste money on a succubus than look at a wizened necromancer. But the facts proved that I was wrong. At this point, Old Fallon laughed at himself. After returning from purgatory, my looks were ruined. Those superficial women left me one after another. Only Ursul took the initiative to find me. She spent a lot of effort to treat the wound on my face, and then one day, she left quietly. Matthew was puzzled. What happened later? Later? There was no later. Child, when you were young, you believed that there would always be time and that those who missed out would always have a chance to meet again. However, in reality, most stories end up with regret. Old Fallon's eyes were filled with sorrow. At that time, I was busy dealing with the wounded soldiers. Later on, I encountered the mining expansion in Rolling Stone Town, by the time I could finally free myself from my work, Ursul had already lost her mind due to an experimental error that caused the negative energy to corrode her brain. She was no longer herself. When I came to look for her, she couldn't even recognize me. I went to the swamp where she lived twice. The first time, she chased me out. The second time, she was a lot clearer in her mind. Before she died, she left everything else to the two apprentices, who were often beaten and scolded by her, except for this whip. At first, I thought she wanted to whip me. Later, I realized that this whip was a magical tool that she had spent her entire life creating. It contained all her understanding of the summoning of the undead. She probably thought that the two untalented apprentices were not enough to display its value, so she entrusted me to find a good home for it. Old Fallon said all this in one breath. His gaze lingered on the whip for a few seconds, then he looked away and said in a congratulatory tone, Now, it's yours. Matthew took a deep breath and tightened his grip on the whip. I won't let it down. Old Fallon nodded. I believe you. The two of them were silent for a while. Soldier, who was beside him, watched as Matthew put away Ursul's reprimand. The envy in his soul fire almost materialized and jumped out. Seeing this, Matthew could only sigh. As for the firefly and the bright moon, I think I can only choose to rent them. Compared to buying, renting was undoubtedly the more expensive option. But Matthew had no choice. The cash flow on hand was not enough to support a one-time purchase. And now the storm is coming. He really needed these two short knives to increase soldiers' combat strength. After weighing the pros and cons, he could only use the title deed that he had just obtained as collateral. After a series of procedures, Matthew walked out of the veteran's building tiredly. Behind him, Soldier was wearing the Dark Knight cloak, and his soul flames were flickering. Old Fallon also smiled. If you need other weapons, you are welcome to look for me. My arsenal contains sharp weapons from all over the world, so I don't think you will be disappointed. Matthew smiled bitterly and did not reply. Old Fallon suddenly said. Oh right, if you can find a better way to cure or alleviate the venom of the viper. I can give you this pair of short knives directly. I can even give you another high-quality weapon. Viper Venom? Matthew recalled the group of veterans who were smoking and moaning in the rooms on the second floor. Then he nodded his head vigorously. I'll try. He left the veteran's building. Matthew deliberately went to the shop in the craftsman's area again. He bought ten sturdy shovels. Then, he walked briskly back to the oak forest and began his tree-planting journey. In the evening. His planting quota for the day was completed as scheduled. After a simple dinner, he started meditating and learning spells. Unknowingly. 
the moon was already hanging on the branches. In the wooden house. Matthew stretched his back, picked up the sack with the shovel, and walked out to the open space. He walked all the way to the zombie dormitory, summoned the five silver moon zombies, and dropped shovels in front of them.